Thank you. On behalf of the entire session, the CRC welcomes you to this, our final congregational gathering in the denominational option series. My name is Dirk D. Cook. I'm privileged to be the chair of the Church Relations Committee and to serve with a wonderful group of men and women. We're here this afternoon primarily because of two reasons. First, a congregational survey indicated that at least 59% of you wanted to depart the PCUSA. And secondly, the session has not been happy with the direction the PCUSA has been trending. In light of those facts, and with the primary goal to keep this church together as one body of Christ, the session of First Press has charged the CRC with providing timely and accurate information to the congregation concerning denominational affairs and options in the event this historic church should decide to leave the denomination. We thank you for attending the past gatherings at which the CRC has provided a full and balanced lineup of denominational options during these trying denominational times. We want to thank the congregation also for your broad-based support as, that we have received during this process. If you were unable to attend any of the previous gatherings, John Garza has videotaped them, is videotaping this one, and they're available on the website. At our first gathering eight weeks ago, we addressed the property and legal issues. Today, we are here to continue our series, should we decide where we might go, should we decide to leave. Over the past three gatherings, we have heard from representatives from the EPC, the PCUSA, and the fellowship community. Today, we will conclude our series by presenting an overview of the Evangelical Covenant Order of Presbyterians, ECO for short, by focusing on what ECO is, what it believes, what it would mean if FPC were to become a member of ECO, and a statement on what our guest sees as the future of the Evangelical Covenant Order. This afternoon, we will once again, out of respect for the guest, ask you to keep our discussion focused on matters of ECO. There will be opportunities in the future for further discussion of other topics. Before we introduce our speaker, I'd like Sandy to uh, start us in prayer. Thank you. Our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who has redeemed us, the one who has called us to be your church, the one who has lifted this church up in this community to represent you, to proclaim the gospel, to serve the needs of the community, to witness as we go from this place between Sundays wherever we go, to be the light of Jesus. We come before you this morning with humble hearts. You know the state of our church family right now. You know there is division. You know there is some anger. And you know there is some joy and anticipation for what we are yet to become. We, many of us are conflicted. Many of us are absolutely certain the direction we should go. And so how do we come together and stay together as a church family, expressing our love for you and for each other. We pray, Lord, that there will be a prevailing attitude of welcome and kindness and generosity and love among all of us. We pray that relationships that are broken will be mended. We pray that they will be made stronger and that all of us will remember that we are one family in Jesus Christ. We pray that you will fill our speaker this morning with your Holy Spirit. Speak through him with power and clarity and give us ears to hear. Give us the understanding of where you want us to go. It is your will that we seek, Lord. We thank you for ECO. We thank you, Lord, for the strong witness they have, the powerful stand that they have for your word. So we pray that this meeting together will be a blessing to each one of us, that it will not only give us information, but that you would stir a fire in our hearts about where we should go, what we should do, and that we'll, you will unify us 
Give us joy, Lord. Give us joy in serving you and give us gladness in being together. And may this particular time that we spend together this morning be productive. Be productive for our understanding, for our future, for our relationships. And we will give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you the Reverend Dr. Dana Allen. Dana has served as a pastor in two Peace USA churches, one in Florida and one in California. He has formerly served as chairman of the board of ECO and currently serves in what we would think of as the executive director position for the entire denomination under the title of Synod Executive. Interestingly, ECO does not have a general assembly. Senate is the highest body in the denomination. In short, Dana has spent his entire life serving the Lord he loves and has a passion to encourage and inspire leaders. Welcome, Dana. We're delighted and privileged to have you here with us this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, good afternoon. It's great to be here with all of you. I know that there is nothing more fun than going through denominational discernment, right? Right? Yes, that is a joke. I do know that it is um, difficult. Uh, when our church went through the process in Florida, we knew that it was, uh, it was challenging and tense. But many, many are praying for you, not only within this church, but um, across the country. We certainly pray for all churches that are in the midst of discernment. And we do pray that as you move forward in whatever direction the Lord calls for you, that this would be an opportunity to unite, not divide the congregation, toward the mission and ministry that God has called for your church. One of the things that I, I like to encourage churches before I even get started, having seen many, many churches go through this process, and sometimes people will say, how can we go through this process well? And I'll say I think the number one factor is when the congregation as a whole and every single person within it has the attitude that we want to discern where is the best place for our particular church, not what do I want. I'll give you a quick example. My own father uh, is a, or was an elder of a PCUSA church, and it was a more progressive congregation. And when this congregation, all the congregations in that presbytery, were having to make a decision as to whether they were going to stay or leave. There was no kind of default. Everyone had to make that decision. And my father is an evangelical in a progressive church, and he said, I'm really torn because I desperately would want to go to Eco, but that's not what's the best thing for this church. And so I need to vote to stay even though I want to leave. And conversely, when our church was making our decisions, we had a couple of people who said, I would prefer to stay in the Peace USA, but I know that that's not what's best for this congregation. And so they would vote to leave, even though they felt called to stay. And so whatever the outcome is of this, what will help your church go forward in mission and ministry and be more united on the other side, again, whatever that other side is, it will happen when each person takes the attitude of prayerfully discerning, what does God want, not do what do I want. So that's just, that's no extra charge for that, um, but it is highly encouraged. A um, couple of things that, uh, that I want to do today. I want to talk a little bit about how ECO was found and just to remind you of a few things along that line. Give you a little bit about ECO's identity and ethos <clears throat> and leave the vast majority of our time open for questions and answers. We had dinner last night with members of the Church Relation Committee and we spent about three hours, about half hour total with small talk, about two and a half hours with questions. So I can only imagine if they're indicative of all of you that there may be lots of questions. So we want to certainly scratch where you all itch. Um, when we look at how ECO was started, I think it's important to remember, and I'll walk through this if, you're, uh, if you have any uh, trouble seeing it, is that the people who are now in ECO Again, by and large, we came from the Peace USA. That's not entirely true. But 
by and large, we came from the Peace USA. And the ethos of those of us who are now in eco had always had the desire, how can we stay in the Peace USA? We want to stay in the Peace USA. And it initially started with renewal movements that wanted to be able to try to protect and preserve the denomination theologically. And so there would be overtures that would try to help protect and move it and keep it in a um, evangelical kind of conservative um, venue. And then over a period of time, that become, it became increasingly difficult. And so the move was then to say, okay, well, we just want to stay who we are. Even though we know the denomination is going in this direction, we as evangelicals, we just want to stay who we are. And so there was a proposal for a 17th synod within the Peace USA. And that got defeated. There was proposals for non-geographical presbyteries. Could we align instead of geographically? Could we align in, with people who are like-minded so that we didn't have to spend as much time um, fighting and all of that stuff and focus on the mission? And that was defeated. And then more recently, what was the straw on the camel's back for most people was we said, well, even in the midst of denomination changing standards, can we as a local church still do what we've always done? And the reality was, and it went all the way to the General Assembly PJC in the Peace USA, was that a local church and a local presbytery could not have requirements for officers that were higher than the requirements for the denomination as a whole. And so we, were, we used to make our elders sign things to say, you know, you have to believe Jesus is the only way to salvation. You have to believe in the infallibility of Scripture. And we were flat out told, no, you can't do that anymore. And so the attitude, our understanding was, if we're going to stay who we are, we have to change. And if we're going to stay who we are, we have to change. But not only that, if we're not just going to stay who we are, but if we're going to become more of who God wants us to be, we want to change and go eco. And so let me tell you then a little bit about as we were um, addressing eco and creating it, we knew that there were two challenges. Uh, the first challenge are the theological challenge that we were facing in the Peace USA. And those are the things that bring congregations, they're the presenting issues that bring congregations to the floor of discernment. But we said there's not only do we need to be safe theologically, we also saw an institutional challenge. That a denomination should be built around the, the health and the vitality of the local congregation, not on organizational um, sustaining and, and trying to, and all of, all of the, the bickering. So we want to create a, a denomination that both, yes, was safe theologically, but institutionally had a different type of an ethos that could really be focused on the health and vitality of the local congregation. So where we are today, we have 217 churches um, in nine presbyteries. Six of those presbyteries across the country are getting ready to, to multiply and form either two or three additional presbyteries, so we're excited to see that. We have roughly 100 churches that are, quote, on the way. Um, that would be a church that has said, that whose session has said we're going to eco when and if we can, and they're in the various stages of the process. And then there's potentially two to 400 more, this is a little harder to pin down, two to 400 more that are discerning or potentially discerning, and First Press San Antonio would be um, certainly among that group as well. Of the churches we have in, we have almost 100,000 members at this point, um, so it is exciting to see um, the vibrancy that is occurring. There is also, which is not mentioned here, about 25 different church plants in the works across the country. We're grateful when churches transition, uh, transfer to us, but just as you all as a church don't just want to have members that transfer from other churches, you want to reach new people for Jesus, so we don't just want churches to transfer, we want to plant new churches that are reaching new people for Jesus. Our mission is to build flourishing churches that make disciples of Jesus Christ. We want to make sure that we are crystal clear that our mission is your mission. 
that our presbyteries, our denominations, do not have a separate mission from the local church. Our mission is for the local church to be healthy and vibrant and flourishing and making disciples of Jesus Christ. And I can say that I believe all that we do, or the vast majority of what we do, what we spend our money on, is all, and where we're going, is all geared around how can we help sure, make sure that local churches are flourishing and they're in the environment to fulfill the mission that God has called them to fulfill. So when we created ECO, we, um, one of the things that was helpful for us to understand is Jim Collins, who's an expert on organizations, says that for an organization to thrive, it needs to preserve the eternal core of who it is and stimulate progress. And so it needs to, to stay the same, it needs to, to hold on to the core, but there's some ways in which that it needs to stimulate progress. And I would say that what we in ECO believe is core and what we believe in is progress is usually the opposite of what we experienced in the Peace USA. So let me just define for you what we believe is core and what we believe is progress. What is core? It's our theological understanding. It's the understanding, and we have a, a list of essential tenets and a wonderful document that, that outlines the basic essentials of the Christian and the Reformed faith. It includes things like the authority and infallibility of Scripture. That Scripture, we study it, and we wrestle with it, and we look into historical context, but we do all those things ultimately so that Scripture can change us, not us changing Scripture. Can I get an amen, right? That's our goal. That's our guide. Now, with that becomes the person in the work of Jesus Christ, the centrality of his death and resurrection and our faith in him for salvation. And then there's other things that come out uh, as well. God's desire for us to live a holy life that is in conformity with his word. That's part of what's core. What is also core is participating in the totality of Jesus' mission in the world. I'm so sad that over the years there has been this, this division between conservative and, and liberal where, where liberals have wanted to say, well, we need to do the deeds of Jesus out into the world. And conservatives have said, well, we just need to share Jesus' love with people and help them to know him as Lord and Savior. And the answer is, it's not an either or, is it? It's a both and. We absolutely need to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world, reaching real needs. And the PCUSA has been good at that. But we also need to share Jesus' love so that people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So as we heard, for those of you who are in here, that our, our records are reversed if you were in here during, during the message. So that's also core. What's also core for us is covenantal relationships. So we, we actually, when people will say, well, what churches do you turn away? Because we, we do sometimes say to a church, you may not be a good fit with us. And usually if a church wants to be functionally independent, they're not a good fit with us. We actually want to reclaim, I think, what it means to be Presbyterian. And so we have mission affinity groups where, where churches three or four of, in a somewhat similar dynamic are able to share what God has done in the past for them and, and where they're called to go in the future and hold one another to accountability and encouragement. When my church, the church I served, Indian River in Fort Pierce, Florida, when we went into ECO, I, I was grateful that, that some of the people that were the most excited about us going into to ECO were our older people. Because they said, we really feel like ECO is reclaiming what it means to be Presbyterian and connectional that we felt as a loss for so many years. And then our younger people were also uh, some of the most excited because they said, in the midst of a world that is culturally confused, we need the church to be able to stand up for truth and educate and nurture our children in the ways of the Lord and his word. And so we require churches to be in covenantal relationships. We require pastors to be in pastor covenant groups. So we are a very highly connectional, relational denomination in that way. But then when it comes to progress, progress can be in flexibility in how the, the local church is able to function. For example, a local church can have something called assistant pastors. So you don't go through a, a, the call process for a normal associate pastor. This is great for um, both younger people, perhaps a youth director who's ready to be ordained, and the church, if it's a good fit, can more easily bring that person into an ordained capacity. 
Um, this is also this role of assistant pastors and not requiring all of the um, denominational minimums as far as salary and those type of things that we used to experience has opened up wonderful doors for, for women to be able to be ordained in capacities and places that they were not able to um, when these churches were in the PCUSA. So there's those kinds of, of flexibilities. Uh, the way that, that deacons are used and called, there's, there's flexibility um, in there. The terms of elders also isn't just a one-size-fits-all rule, but, but congregations need to govern themselves a little differently, sometimes based on size, and so there's, there's flexibility in that. Um, decisions in presbytery based on uh, mutual discernment and not a one-size-fits-all process. So people will often ask me, you know, what's, what's the process for getting a new pastor? And that obviously can be um, something that's on the forefront of First Press San Antonio's mind. And what we say is we will walk with the congregation, the presbytery will walk and say, what's the best way for this congregation to go through the process? If in sometimes there's been a, a long tenured pastor, then sometimes it's better to have a longer interim pastor to, to help someone new come in well. If sometimes a person has uh, not been there very long, that actually having a long extended interim pastor is detrimental to the congregation. And so the presbytery helps to say, what's the best for this congregation, rather than say, well, here's the rule, here's the process that everybody has to follow. And so I love that about our nimbleness and, uh, and tactfulness. Um, progress for us is our understanding of missional church. Our, you know, we normally think of church as what happens here on Sunday. Um, but the reality is, if we look missiologically, that is how missionaries view church, there's the church universal, where wherever believers are present, there are denominations and networks that are groups of churches, there's the local church, um, an established church like First Press San Antonio, but then there's wherever two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus. Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered, there I am. Now Jesus isn't saying, right, that, oh, well, you have to have two people to show up in order for, for me to bother being there, right? You know, it's just, I mean, if you're just by yourself, it's just not enough people for me to bother. No, he's not saying you have to have a quorum. What Jesus is saying is, though, is if there's two or three gathered in my name, there is an expression of the body of Christ. And so we actually allow in eco, we call these micro expressions of church, we actually allow the sacraments to be celebrated in those contexts. So that we have small groups that are reaching people in my old church that were reaching people who could have never or would have never walked through the front door of our church. And, and this is their church expression and they're doing the things that church does and the people that are leading those can actually celebrate the Lord's Supper and celebrate baptism in those contexts. And so again, it's much more of a, a missional stance to go forward in church. Um, also, progress for us is stretching, changing the structure and the focus of meetings um, so that there's less focus on business. It's part of the reason we, we, we don't have a trust clause in ECO. Um, we don't have any claim on, or nor do we want any claim on property ownership because then we have to, to look at those kinds of aspects when a church is coming in rather than focusing on mission and ministry. So, so much of our, our national meetings and our local meetings are focused on how do we reach a world that desperately needs Jesus. You know, there's potentially, from studies, 250 million people in the United States that don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That makes the United States the third largest mission field in the world. We gotta go after that, right? We have to not be spending so much time talking about, you know, uh, each other's finances and property and all that kind of stuff and instead focus on mission. Okay, that's my, my soapbox. Um, we also want to be an aggressive church planting. Again, I think this is a wonderful opportunity, and, and we don't have, um, we don't want to say to churches, give us your money for church planting and let us decide how to spend it. We want to say to three or four churches or two churches or one church, depending, depending on the size, to say, we want to help you determine where God wants to plant a church. And it may be for First Press San Antonio, it may be, you know, there's people that you wouldn't ordinarily reach, but you would love to see a church that's reaching them, you, that we can help you be able to, to structure that and to come up with, with the plan and help you find a planter and all of those kind of things to fulfill that vision. So that's something that's very important to us is aggressive church planting. 
I'm not going to focus on um, these five shifts. Um, I do want to leave time for questions. One of the things I would also encourage you, if there are further questions beyond what I can answer, if you want to go back and look at things, on ECO's website, under the resource tab, is an ECO information series. And that is six short video presentations between 10 and 20 minutes about some of the various aspects of who ECO is, um, along with some supplemental material that, that goes along with it. And so would encourage you to also look at those types of, of, of things uh, in the future. And the second one of those is all about the shifts that we believe our congregations need to make coming in. We don't want churches to just think that eco is the promised land, right? Uh, we made it to eco, great, now we've fulfilled our mission. No, our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And so we've kind of identified five shifts that we really believe um, congregations, by and large, need to make if we're going to fulfill that mission and vision. But I don't want to go into those in great detail here just because I want to leave time for the question and answers um, that you all have. So I understand we have some microphones, right? And it's okay to go ahead and um, you can raise your hand or do that however. I do apologize for my voice. I'm getting over a sickness here and I'm just glad that I have some voice left. Uh, Tom Thompson, not a member here, but uh, an adherent of this church and uh, interested in where the church is going before we make a membership decision. And my question is, how is ECO supported and what is the role of the individual congregation to support ECO financially? Yeah. So how is ECO supported? Um, we, our membership fee, if you will, is 1% of a church's annual budget. Um, ordinarily, what that means for the vast majority of our churches, I can only think of one or two exceptions, that that was less than the, what they were paying in the PCUSA. And so for my church, for example, um, we were paying uh, $30 a member in per capita, which came out to about $30,000. And then when we came into ECO, uh, our annual dues went down to $10,000. So that's the, um, that's the model is that, that 1% model for our funding structure. We encourage churches to continue to give, but not to us, again, to things like church planting. Let me say one other thing about that. We also believe, part of the reason why our funding is lower, we don't think, we don't think the denomination should provide all, everything for the church. And the reason is there's some great people out there doing wonderful stuff. And so there's churches that are sometimes in congregational transformation processes, and instead of bringing in the denomination, we're saying, hey, with the money that you're saving in dues, if you need to do a congregational study, here's some great people that we're partnered with outside of our tribe that can help you go through that process, and we encourage you to, to use them. So that's part of the mindset as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, First Presbyterian has uh, 10 or 12 missionaries that we support, and they're under the auspices of PCUSA. And uh, what are we going to do with those people? I mean, how are we going to address them when they find out, whoa, we're not doing that anymore? Right. Right. How do we address missionaries that you are supporting? First of all, we always encourage churches when it comes to global mission. If you're doing something that you think is God-honoring and Christ-exalting, keep doing it. Um, and so if you feel that the ministry they're doing is God-honoring and Christ-exalting, keep doing it. We had some people that were missionaries that were connected to our church that were PCUSA ordained, and we continue to support them. Now, my understanding is that at First Press San Antonio, you support them, but you support them through the Outreach Foundation or through Antioch Partners or Presbyterian Frontier Fellowship, and those are the organizations that, that we work with. In fact, we, we really believe in global mission, and we have some, some things that are going on, but we don't want to create our own arm 
internally because those organizations do global missions so well and, and so efficient that it's better for people, for them, to kind of help facilitate eco-churches in global mission than for us to create an own bureaucratic institution under us. So, um, so I would encourage you to just to continue doing, when I talked with uh, the people on your CRC, that what you're supporting, you will still absolutely be able to support if you so choose. Um, I'm the chair of Global Missions, past chair the last couple of years, and um, nothing, regardless of whether we stay in the PCUSA or move to another denomination, nothing regarding our mission effort is going to change. For about 15 years, uh, the church has given absolutely nothing to the PCUSA for mission, uh, direct mission funding since you know, over time, the definition of mission has changed in the PCUSA to really be everything that the PCUSA does. So all of our missionary uh, contacts are individuals or organizations that we've reviewed and we fund uh, as a church. And it doesn't matter what denomination we go to, that's not going to change. So uh, as far as missions, First Pres and their heart for missions is not going to be affected by what we're discerning. I'm a young member of the church, and I'm just curious, would you elaborate more? You talked about the sacraments being recognized in small groups. Could you give some examples of that? Sure. Yeah, the, um, the sacraments being celebrated in small groups. So, again, our definition of church is, I think, a biblical definition, that it's not just what happens here, but wherever believers are gathered in the name of Jesus. So, one example is, you know, we had some small groups that were primarily made of, of people inside of the church. And for a few of those small groups, the people that were leading them, um, we really felt confident in their um, theological integrity, their spiritual maturity, their leadership skills. So we gave them some additional training uh, to be able to allow them to celebrate communion in their midst. And, and that was just a very wonderful experience for those particular individuals and in celebrating sacraments um, in that particular environment. For some of the other communities are more what we would call missional in focus. And so they might be 10 people from the church, but they're reaching out to people who, again, wouldn't normally be coming in to the front door of the church. They're reaching them in such a way that they're coming to faith and they can actually um, have baptisms in those communities as well. So again, those leaders have to, have, it's not every elder and every deacon, but it is particular ones that the session and the congregation feels are appropriate um, environments and people to celebrate the sacraments in those contexts under the authority of the session and the senior pastor. Am I on? <laughs> I'm Lynn Martin, and just a couple of things. I've been a Presbyterian for about 65 years. I've been in four different denominations or closely associated with them. And I went to both meetings, I attended both meetings, the one in Orlando and the one in Dallas last year, the combined uh, FOP and ECO meeting. Now, I got the impression that ECO, uh, and I, I hope I use an understandable definition here, that ECO is appealing to the contemporary service and minimizing the appeal to the traditional service, especially in the Orlando meeting. So I, I just wonder what your comment would be about that. Sure. Um, I think, so the, the question being, I think the feeling of those particular gatherings was a little higher on contemporary music than on traditional music. Um, and in some ways, that has to do with the venue and the place that you're at. It's, it's difficult to get. Um, our next gathering is going to be at St. Andrew's Presbyterian in Newport Beach. And, you know, we're, all, we're already going to have one. We've, you know, working with one very traditional service um, in that particular context and one very contemporary service. Um, and so trying to appeal broadly is easier to do in a church environment than it is in a hotel environment. So that was, that's one thing. But what we would also say, though, is that for those who are um, 
you know, those who are coming into ECO, there's certainly no requirement on ECO's part that you change your style of worship. My particular church coming into ECO had two traditional services and one contemporary service uh, just like you all. And we had that before we went into ECO. We had that after we went into ECO. And that's still what they have, what they have today. My question deals with the geographic membership of the ECO churches. Uh, do you have information about what percentage come from what part of the country? And I'm particularly interested, of course, in Texas and Louisiana, which is the presbytery that we would belong to, should we go with ECO? Yes. Um, one thing I would mention about that is that you can always see on our website, um, you can see all of our churches, and you can, it's an it's a interactive Google map, so you can always dive into a place and go, go back out. Um, there are a lot of churches in Texas. We do assume that the Texas Press Prairie will, um, will multiply at some point in the, next, in the next year, most likely. Um, there's a fair amount of churches that are in now and a lot more that are um, on the way or potentially on the way. I would also say about presbyteries, we have those mission affinity groups. Um, because presbyteries don't have to worry about, you know, the finances of the church, those types of things. Lots of stuff can be put out to ministry teams. The presbyteries themselves meet less often. Um, Texas Presbytery does have a meeting coming up in the end of September. I'll be there and, and we'll be preaching at that. Um, but a lot of times those presbyteries will do business kind of virtually and allow some of the things like working with churches in, con con in transition to happen within the mission affinity groups. Um, and so that's, I think, a better and healthier way to be able to, to go about it. But we have about 20 churches in Texas right now, others that are, you know, popping up. And because of your state law, um, they're going through it usually a different way than is oftentimes in the rest of the country. Where is that Presbytery meeting to be held? In Houston, at Wynwood Presbyterian Church in Houston. Hi, I'm Julie Norton, a longtime member here, and I had a question to ask you just about mechanics. One of the functions of the PCUSA is to provide uh, health insurance plans and pension plans for uh, ordained uh, uh, ministers and, as well as staff. How do you organize that sort of infrastructure? Great. Yes, we have a health care um, a, a healthcare program. Um, it's actually very financially um, sound. It is very uh, um, able because we were created in the midst of um, healthcare reform. We were created in such a way that we can respond very well to some of the changing things that are occurring nationally when it comes to healthcare. Some denominations are actually looking at, at negating their own healthcare and joining ours, which would be great because obviously the more pool you get, um, the better that, that you can be. So we have healthcare. Um, it's through Cigna. We're going to um, be opening up to Blue Cross, Blue Shield, just like um, the PCUSA did before. There's a variety of plans that are available. Um, I'm very happy with, with the healthcare system that, and, that we get provided. For the pension aspect, it's a little different than PCUSA. In PCUSA, the pension is a um, defined benefit. And so like teachers or military, when you retire, depending on your years of service and rank, all of those types of things, you know, we don't have rank in the PCUSA, but you know, um, de depending upon those things, you get a certain amount of money per month when you retire as long as you live and your spouse gets some survivability if you die. But once both of you die, that's it, it's gone. In ECO, we have a defined contribution. So it's like a 401k, but it's a 403b9 plan that um, a church puts in 10% additional into a pastor's retirement. And then when there is, uh, the pastor does retire, there's a lot more flexibility. Instead of having this much per month, you can say, well, I'm going to take more of it up front to wait for Social Security to check up, to catch up, or whatever it may be. There's a lot more options when it comes to, um, when it comes to that when it comes to utilizing your pension after, after you're done. So we did try to, especially with the health care, we tried to model and have a plan that was um, very similar to the plan that the PCUSA has, but then we also have five other options that uh, churches can choose from, which is very nice. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Robert Browning. Quick question about the, <clears throat> the per capita 
uh, $7.06 per active member is the figure for this year, denomination-wide, and I think $7.11 for 2016. And you mentioned a $30 uh, per capita. Can you explain mm. what, about that, please? Yeah. In, uh, what I was saying is that um, the $7 or 7 something per capita is what goes nationally. Um, and then each presbytery and synod also tax on money to that. And so in ECO, or in Peace USA, that $30 went up both to General Assembly as well as to Synod as well as to the local presbytery. In ECO, we get 1%, and then we actually give part of that 1% back to the presbyteries for part of its mission and ministry as well. So the $30 figure was the apportion for, for all three levels of government in the Peace USA, and the 1% is the apportion for all of um, the two levels in terms of synod and presbytery in ECO. It appears that uh, churches going through discernment use a lot of spiritual energy. And once a decision is made, that pent up energy goes somewhere. Mm -hmm. Here's my question. For those churches that have joined ECO, given their entering membership when they join ECO, have they stayed stable? Have they declined? Or have they experienced significant growth? Mm -hmm. What's your experience? Yeah, my, ex my experience is that when, when they're entering and coming into ECO, there are certainly um, finding that, you know, sometimes people leave after the process, and so even after you come into ECO, then some of your, your numbers might drop a little bit. Um, what we find is that those who lead with vision and are saying, here's who we can become as a result of being in ECO, um, that there's, yes, spiritual energy, that there's conflict, there's all of those types of things, but that many churches are able to then say, okay, now we want to take all that energy we had in, in discernment, and we want to put it forward in mission and ministry. So for the congregations that do that or move in that direction, um, usually they, we see them um, growing. Or at least, you know, it's not, again, not coming into eco, it doesn't mean automatic growth within, you know, the next year. I don't think it ever means automatic growth. But then churches are saying, okay, so how can we do to really focus to be healthy and vibrant and to allow growth to come out of being healthy? So some congregations certainly have, you know, experienced a drop-off. Um, others are going phenomenally well, and I do think that difference is the attitude of the members going into the process and being able to focus on that the goal isn't just to get out of the PCUSA and into ECO. The goal is, what does God want us to be going forward? There's a lot of talk about the essential tenets of ECO and the need for officers to adhere to those essential tenets. I asked you this question last night and some of us heard the answer, but obviously we were not here last night. I would like to ask you, what if as an individual, I believe in say eight or eight and a half or nine of the essential tenets, but I'm just not totally comfortable with two of those tenets. Would I be eligible to be an officer in that church or would I be closed out? Um, the answer is yes, you would be eligible. And what we require for officers, and I would, I would, because of this particular question, I would encourage if there is any further confusion on this after I'm gone today, to go to the website and look at our statement on, or our video on the theology of ECO, because that, it's going to say the same thing I'm telling you now, but you can go back uh, to it as well. What we require is for officers to adhere to the essentials. So that does not necessarily mean that you have to believe every single word is inspired by God. It's essentials. You know, it was, it was created. But do you adhere to the system of doctrine that is contained within the essentials? And will you in your life and ministry abide by those essentials? So I'll give you just two quick examples on two what we would normally consider to be ends of the spectrum. Um, in my former church, my wife is also um, an ordained pastor in ECO, and when she was ordained, she was ordained in the PCUSA when our church was still there, and there was an elder there who um, was not 
totally convinced of women in ordained um, pastorates. And so he, you know, he said, as we go to ECO, um, I see that part of ECO's essential tenets are that men and women are called to all offices of the church. I, I'm not 100% sure about that. But I'm willing to adhere to the essentials, and I'm not going to speak against a woman getting ordained. I'm not going to not lay hands on the woman, you know, being, being ordained. I'm, I'm going to be supportive in that way, even if I might personally not feel the same way. And conversely, when it comes to, you know, issues of, of quite frankly, sexuality, um, if there is someone who is an elder who said, you know, I would have been okay with the PCUSA um, allowing ordination of, you know, self-affirmed practicing homosexuals or premarital sex or extramarital sex. I would have been okay with that. But I'm going to adhere to the essentials in eco. And in my own life, if I'm single, I'm going to remain chaste. If I'm married in between a man and a woman, then that will be the place where I express my sexuality. Even though I had a little bit of, of, of even though I would have been okay in the Peace USA, I will also submit to the theology of eco, which is you know, in some ways, the same theology that the PCUSA had for 25, you know, up till four years ago. And so I'm going to submit to that theology even though I disagree a little. So that's what we, we require officers to adhere to that in their practice, in their teaching, and uh, in their own personal lives. I'm Ed Moore. I've been a member of this congregation for almost 30 years, a member of Presbyterian Church denominations since high school. Um, this is probably a question that's easily answered on the website. I just don't have my computer with me. Um, we have, as a church, walked very closely with some of the other large churches, particularly in Texas. And I'm just wondering if you can recount for me some of the other large Texas churches that have made this shift or that you know are... Uh, certainly uh, very close in that process. Yeah. Well, in Houston, you have um, uh, Grace Presbyterian in Houston. Um, you have Wynwood, which is a little smaller than you, but it is, you know, it's also medium large. Um, Highland Park in Dallas. Um, First Presbyterian Houston tried to go through the process. They fell up a little short in their vote, and so they're trying to work through a new angle. Memorial Drive um, in Houston is also in the midst of that process as well. Um, so most of those are, are, are the larger churches that I can think of in Texas are either in the process or in the case of First Press Houston did the process and had a little issue and are trying to figure out what's next. Hi, Dana Walter Walthaw. I'm one of the acting elders here and part of the CRC. Getting back to the essential tenets, um, Peace USA has not written them down since 1920, um, in part because they couldn't agree on what the tenets were. For edification purposes, one, what is the advantage of writing these tenets down? Two, where do they stand, say, lined up with the Book of Confessions and Holy Scripture? Yeah, great question. I think part of the advantage of writing them down and articulating them is um, in Peace USA, in the ordination vows, when it says, do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets? And people say, well, what are they? Well, there aren't any, you know, and not only are there not any, you can't make them for your own church. So you can't say, well, the denomination doesn't, but we're going to. You, you can't do that um, and define those. So I think having them written down, I think, is helpful. I think, honestly, they're very center set. And what it allows you, when, when you have a, a place where your essential tenets are, um, are listed out in that way and people are adhering to them, that allows you to have a lot more freedom in mission and ministry. So I experienced in Peace USA an environment of low trust, high control. You know, lots of red tape, lots of this and this, this kind of thing. In ECO, because we have, uh, we hold these essential tenets in common, then one of the advantages is then we can allow celebration of sacraments in these micro expressions. Um, you know, somebody said, a friend of mine who is more progressive in the PCUSA, when we wrote our polity, goes, man, I love your polity. You know, the, the, the vitality and the flexibility and the nimbleness is fantastic. And I said, you realize I would have never voted for this in the PCUSA because we didn't have accord agreed upon um, essential tenets. 
So I think that's part of the advantage of, of having them. You had another part of the question? Great. Yeah, where do they fit into the wider, to the wider body? Um, in the beginning of the essential tenets, it lists the other confessions that are part of our heritage. And it says the essential tenets are a window into the rest of the confessions. So certainly the rest of the um, confessions, you, know, you couldn't articulate all of it with the, um, with the richness that was in some of those confessions. And so you do have to shrink them down, make the you know, cliff notes, if you will. And so they're alongside the confessions um, in, in that particular way. But one of the things that we need to do is we need to recapture what it means to be a confessional church. Because I have seen people get ordained in the Peace USA who believed in things like reincarnation. And, you know, something that's prohibited in every single confession. And so to say, well, we were a confessional church. Well, were you? if someone believes something that's in contrast to every single confession, are you really a confessional church? So we're trying to, you know, really revive what does it mean to be a confessional church? And those essentials are kind of that window in there. Uh, my name is Rick Lane, and I'm a deacon and, and also a uh, local and global mission practitioner. And um, this church was started as a mission church long before there was a, any of the denominations of the Presbyterianism that we see today. They were all derived from other denominational groups that existed 100, 200 years ago. And this church's growth was developed by the nurture of a national and international vision of denominations that existed 150 years ago. And the calling of this church to disciple nations continues today. And the work in some of these nations is enormous. The work before us is enormous. And while this church has been very effective, has been described um, navigating the brokenness of our denominational interaction with national churches, education movements, individual churches, individual presbyteries, other denominations in other countries. While we've navigated all that well, our work in trying to tr help transform nations has been very limited because of the brokenness of our denominational relationships. And our ability to help other nations develop everything from education systems, fundamental things we take for granted here, education systems, hospital systems, legal systems based on integrity, Ten Commandments, biblical teaching, care in the society and in the government, based on Christian principles. Our ability to impact nations with that is something we can try to do alone, and we're incredibly effective doing it alone, but, but we can't do it alone. <laughs> we need the fellowship of other churches to help us do it. And what does ECO offer in encouragement and in vision uh, and organization that can help this church have partners so that when we do help are developing national movements, we're not always alone. I mean, sometimes we are literally doing as much as the entire PCUSA together. The members of this congregation are sometimes in some countries doing as much as the entire PCUSA or the entire Outreach Foundation, who is a wonderful partner that we can continue working with. But what's ECO hope to offer? Mm -hmm. I know it's only three years old. It's a little early to, to say what's the track record. Sure. But what does sure. what ECO hope to offer? Yeah, great, <clears throat> great question. Um, and, you know, one of the things I would say for us when we look at global mission, um, one of the things that we are, that we wrestle with is on the one hand, we don't want to say, here's our denominational program. We want all of you churches to get on board with it because you're doing great things, as some of you have already said. We want to allow congregations to keep doing that. At the same time, we want to connect our congregations, and we have our, um, our now volunteer director of global engagement, Bill Young, who was head of PFF, um, has worked to say, what are all, I mean, just done a great job in contacting all of our churches and saying, what are you doing in terms of global mission? 
And what are ways, and there are churches, and this is sometimes because of the enormity of the PCUSA and people aren't necessarily talking to each other, there were churches working in the same town, in the same village, with the same organization that didn't know about each other. And so they're saying, we ought to connect these together. And so I think that's some of the advantages of being a little bit nimble in that way. Uh, and as we encourage people there, that's the other point where a lot of our larger churches are saying, here's something we're doing in a particular country. And the smaller churches who may not be able to have as robust of a global mission focus, but have a few people that want to be involved, they can partner and come along with First Press San Antonio trip or do something that is, is already there. And so I, I think those are helpful. We're also partnering with you know, again, coming out of the Peace USA, one of the advantages is now we are free to partner with people who are already doing it so well. And so we are partnered, for example, in the um, Arabian Peninsula with people. This was something I was sharing last night. The, um, and I got to be careful because this is recorded, so there's some things that I can't say. But in one of the closed countries in the Middle East, 70% of the house churches there are run by women. And they are in a place where they cannot get, um, you know, resources and materials. And so they get flown out to one of the other countries that's more open, and they get trained on, on how to lead this house church, and they get back with them some information that they're able to take through secretly um, to be able to then disperse and use within their house church. That's a great ministry going on there. We've got some business people involved helping to, you know, how do you help and run and start businesses in this place so that they can stay. And those are great opportunities. We don't want churches to have to do that, but some Presbyterian women groups, for example, saying, man, that would be great. We would love to sponsor, you know, 10 house, 10 house church planters, you know, women house church leaders. What a great, what a great way. So we, we have that kind of nimbleness to be able to connect one another. And it's great to see the things that are emerging. One last quick thing. I'm going in April with 25 pastors of larger eco churches to the Philippines with Compassion. And one of the things we're exploring there is might we be able to kind of sponsor there, um, you know, with these churches. So it's not an eco initiative, but these churches want to do it. And I'm just, you know, able to go along for the ride and watch this partnership come together. Those are the things that are exciting and were not happening previously with, with these churches. Could you talk Thank about you. the status of the property ownership? Mm -hmm. In eco. You're saying in eco, yes. Yeah, in, in eco, we have no trust clause. We have no claim over a local church's property. Um, you own your own property. You manage your own property. And again, part of the reason for that is not, people say, well, what if eco puts one in? I said, well, yeah, good luck trying to get that past, you know, the denomination that has paid so much to get out. But we don't want it in. Because then if, if, we have any claim on ownership, then all of a sudden, if you go into debt, we got to worry and say, okay, well, if the congregation folds, are we able to absorb their debt? And so you have to spend so much time managing those types of things that, again, hinders the focus of mission and ministry. So we, we do not have any claim on church property whatsoever. I'll throw in a question. Um, a lot of us have been to Eco Fellowship gatherings uh, the last several years. Uh, I can't see, I don't remember anybody who's been to one that was just not overwhelmed with the, just the way the Holy Spirit is just running through those and the joy and excitement that goes on in those meetings. Um, those aren't the feelings we're having around here right now. Um, this, this, this process is difficult. It's deflecting us from our mission. Um, have you seen in ECO, uh, when, when a church uh, makes the move and comes on board with ECO, have you seen that joy, excitement, Holy Spirit uh, dominated a faith that we've seen in those meetings, a few of us, have you seen that capture the churches and uh, move them from a place of uh, despair to, to joy. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that we're seeing, especially with the churches that came out earlier in the process, is that 
when they come into eco, they're saying, we want to make it worth it, right? I mean, we do want to stay the same uh, in some ways, but we also want to move forward for the kingdom of God. And so if we spent this time and energy and money to come into eco, we want to make it worth it. And so I think of um, First Presbyterian Church in North Palm Beach, who is a 55-year-old church and has, um, had never planted a church in its history, said, you know what, we want to take charge of this church planting vision. And so they're really organizing and galvanizing 10 different churches to be able to be planting churches in, um, in certainly the east coast of Florida, but then also beyond. And then they're saying, you know what, we have, and we have flexibility with this in ECO, we have some um, minority areas and pastors that could serve as church planters for these minority areas that couldn't get you know, the, pay the money to get an MDiv and things like that that would ordinarily be required in the PCUSA. We want to have a training school for them so that they can plant churches in these indigenous areas and in ways that are going to look different than our churches. And so they're really saying, these are the things that we get to do now. And there's an excitement and enthusiasm to say, really, um, the sky's the limit in terms of, you know, when I'm talking to, to churches all the time and as far as what do you want to do, don't it's not our polity that's holding you back. Um, you know, it's, it's really your own uh, imagination with the Holy Spirit on what God's call is. Mr. Chairman, if there are no more questions. I got one more here. Is there one? I have a motion to make after this question. A motion? Oh, I am Virginia Nicholas, and I am an elder on rotation, and I would ask that the congregation go to Scripture. Look at Job chapter 11. It gives you some insight into what we're hearing today. Are there other questions? Mr. Chairman, I move that we thank our speaker and adjourn. Thank you, Dana, for the gift of your time and wisdom. Uh, thank you, congregation, for your interest and your presence. Uh, this will conclude this meeting. Uh, be in prayer. We have uh, some decisions to make as a session and as a congregation. Uh, basically, we find ourselves uh, in light of the 59% vote in the congregational survey, the majority we know wants to leave. Our choice is basically to remain within the PCUSA in exile or exodus from the PCUSA. Exile or exodus is our choice. Be in deep prayer for these things. God bless y'all. Thank you for being here. Have a great week.